Welcome to Ep Interludes with Chris McKenzie. And I have with me in the studio again, luckily, lucky old Golden Days Radio, Bill Akers, uh, director of productions, lighting designer for the Australian Ballet, acting, dancing, everything. <laughs> Hello, Bill. Well, Welcome back. Yes, I, thank e you very everything. much. <laughs> <laughs> everything that's publishable. Um, <laughs> thank you very I, much for coming back. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, now, with last time we were talking, you had just been um, introduced and we were introducing yourself to Edward Vedborovansky. Yes, um, and what a wonderful introduction it was, although I didn't think so at the time. Um, I started off as assistant stage manager in that company and wound up uh, being a stage director. And at that time, there was only um, one other stage director in Australia, and that was Ian Roberts. Uh, who did Gilbert and Sullivan and musicals and things mm. like that. I was always classical. And um, <laughs> it. Um, I only went for two months. Williamson said, I mean, Harold Bowden said, you're only there for two months, I guess. And I said, uh, yes, sir. But I said, you promised me that I was going to play the juvenile lead in a play called Dear Charles. That's all right. That's still on. Well, of course, it wasn't. Mr. Borovansky and I got on like a house on fire. So he stamped over to Williams and says, he stays with me, you see. So <laughs> I stayed, I think, for two years and ten months that tour ran. Yeah. And, of course, his company was not subsidised in any way at all. It was he. It was a highly successful ballet company that made a lot of money. And at one stage, it was keeping some musicals on the road. But, like... Not being subsidised, it didn't run all the time. I think the first tour was two years and ten months that I was with it. And then it stopped for a year while Mr. Borovansky went overseas, got new repertoire, dancers, guest artists and things like that. Then he would come back and start the company again. The dancing kids, whom I adore, um, uh, they uh, dancers really are the most wonderful people. They're, they just, you watch them work and they do it for what they, I mean, they don't get paid a lot of money and they work like hell. Mm. I mean, wharf laborers don't work any harder than, no, than, no. than dancers do. And so I, uh, I was then given a, a couple of plays to do. Um, one of the first one was Reluctant Debutante with Ursula Jeans and Roger Livesey, which was a great and very happy company. Mm. Uh, we had a wonderful time there, and then I was hawked back to do the second Alden Shakespeare company. Oh, good. Well, of course, most of the people, of course, had, had gone. We had a whole new company, and, and uh, John had had a heart attack in the meantime, and they brought out um, John Laurie, that wonderful Scottish oh, actor. Oh, yes. They brought John Laurie out to alternate the, the leading roles with him. And um, that was a, that company was wonderful. It wasn't quite as successful as the first one. But my job was to to get out of Williamson's where the scenery had all gone because it you know, stacked away. So to find all the scenery and actually re reproduce the whole thing from a technical standpoint oh, right. and uh, Bill Reese was the assistant director mm -hmm. but uh, on the dramatic side of it but I was the, the person who put the shows together physically mm -hmm. and um, when it got to um, this particular area um, uh, when we got to the stage where we were going to light the shows um, they said to Mr Reese, who's going to light the show? And there was a big silence. And there was a terrible pause. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, um, well, I don't like Haven't you got anybody that can do it? And Sir Frank said, as he always did, oh, Bill will do it. <laughs> Bill, he was fainting. It was shock and horror. <laughs> Although I had, when Mr. Borovansky lit his shows, he used to sit in the stalls with um, with Bill Constable, who was a wonderful designer and uh, and designed nearly all of Borrow's ballets. And uh, they would sit out there and fight and battle with one another, lighting the shows. And I had to stand on the stage and write down, you know, what the plot was when we got yep. to it. And it got to the stage where one achieved a certain degree of proficiency in that we arrived back on one occasion in Her Majesty's Theatre from Adelaide and the scenery had arrived at about four o'clock in the afternoon. We were opening that night. And um, one ballet, Eternal Lovers, which has the most complicated light, but 31 light cues in 29 minutes. Good heavens. And there was no, um, we didn't have all this electronic gear in those days. And um, there was no opportunity. And I said to the lighting man, I'll talk you through it. So I called every light for every cue in between. We got to the end. The man who was the head electrician, whose name was Harold, um, Harold Oh, isn't that ridiculous, having forgotten his name? He was a wonderful man. He was an ex-Navy man. 
frightfully so didn't like me very much i thought i was a bit flippity chippet i think but he came up after the end of this and he said you got your guns right today son you won <laughs> you won congratulations <laughs> anyway this started a silly sort of reputation you see and so I did Ursula Jeans and Roger Livesey and then went to do this particular um, Alden Shakespeare Company. We got all that together and I did like the shows because I think I didn't have any, any training to do that except at the school, but that was minimal. And um, I think I had an eye for it. I, mm -hmm. I just have an eye for colour. And I could remember how the scenes looked when they were first lit. And I was able to reproduce and it started this... this idea that I was a lighting designer. Oh, right. So, of course, mm -hmm. I, I did learn all the, the techniques of, of what the lanterns were and what they would do, etc. Mm -hmm. After that, just in case, well, in case came up not too long after, I went from there back to, to Williamson's to do a play called um, oh, what is it? The Amorous Prawn. Yes. Now, that was a lovely piece of work, but it, but it did um, introduce me to a wonderful lady called Gloria Dawn who was a f fantastic artist. She was just an amazing person. And, and um, she made me go out and sing to people, you know, old ladies' homes and things like that in, in between matinee and evening performances to enter. And I would sing with her, which was wonderful. Oh, lovely. And she was the first person who called me Angel. Oh, really? <laughs> because what's well, always been my nickname since then. Um, I was um, put, see the people in this play, apart from the English leads, all came from some sort of variety in vaudeville and they weren't used to the kind of so i came from the ballet company where everything was very strict you know the the discipline and it always needs to be mm -hmm. was very strict and when uh, we came to rehearsals for this play the first day i was <clears throat> um in the corner and it was five to ten and rehearsals were about to say and they were all mucking around these people and laughing and telling jokes and i said ladies and gentlemen the director will arrive in a minute would you please be in your places for the start of the play and, and a couple of other things like that. And the next day, and I called them to order because they really were playing up. But they were just having fun. I didn't understand mm. them. And Gloria mm. Dawn said, here's the classical Sheila in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, she means, she means me. <laughs> I don't hear anyone say that. You know? um, and of course, Williamson's very strict and all this. And... The, the, the fellow said, um, Frankie Ward, dear darling Frank Ward, said um, he became an ABC uh, television producer later. Uh, and I was actually understudying him. And he said, um, he's um, uh, the guy who's going to light the show and um, stage direct it. And she said, he looks like the devil. <laughs> she, he said, well, the devil was called Lucifer. He was the angel of light, so I guess that's it. And she called me angel forever after that, and so did everybody else. <laughs> went on from there. Anyway, I went from there, and I went, I was doing the Amorous Prawn, and I was on tours in Brisbane, and suddenly I was called um, by uh, John McCallum. And uh, John McCallum and I didn't always really get along terribly well, but um, uh, due to an argument that I'd had with Peggy Van Private. But I was called and um, told that um, I was going to, to stage direct Oliver. Well, Oliver was the plum job, you know. And I said, but why? You know, there's a trick in this somewhere. <laughs> and he said, well, you work with the ballet and you're used to with working with children. And he said, in this, this um, and I know you're fond of animals, and he said, in this show, uh, there are 26 small boys, a dog, and Sheila Bradley. <laughs> and I said, not necessarily in that order, I hope. Sheila Bradley's a very good friend of mine. <laughs> anyway, I was thrilled to get that it, was I really lovely. was. And he said, I, but I still didn't, I didn't believe that's what that was all about. And, and he said, well, another reason is, of course, that you have worked with Mr. Borovansky all these years, and you got to get along mm. very well with him. And Mr. Borovansky is probably the most difficult person that we have, you know, in, in this um, area. Um, and we we thought that you'd be the appropriate person to deal with Mr. Peter Coe, who's an extremely difficult man, very temperamental, and with whom we'll probably have a lot of trouble. You said, I said, you mean with whom I'll have a lot of trouble? <laughs> and he said, well, we're hoping that you'll be able to, to fix that. So I thought I knew there'd be a catch in it somewhere. So <laughs> I went off to Oliver. Well, um, Mr. Coe arrived um, the following Tuesday. He was about six feet one. Uh, he was wearing a long, almost see-through cotton caftan, 
uh, had a very beautiful young woman on his arm. He had red hair that was parted in the middle and hung down to his shoulders, a red beard and looked exactly like Jesus Christ and behaved like him all the time he was there. I've never met such a wonderful man in my life. He was a fabulous director. He was a wonderful man. We hit it off like just like that from, from day one. And um, when we got to, to the dress rehearsal of the show, uh, we did the first dress rehearsal and he called everybody onto the stage and he said, um, I had just had an idea actually, the entrance of, of uh, Bill Sykes, I was sitting with this, this lovely lady of his and um, she, she, she said he's never really known how to stage this entrance because most of the people who sing it can't sing well anyway, but they have to be great big burly people who can bang clubs and look terribly butch and mm -hmm. everything. Well, uh, John Maxim, who was the man who played it, was exactly like that. He didn't have the world's greatest voice. He had a big voice, there was no doubt about that. But um, it's an awful song. Mm -hmm. It's not a very, you know, big men tremble when they hear it and all the rest mm -hmm. of that. And I said, well, I've got an idea for it. And she said, what is it? And I said, well, if you start him off, what he, what he used to do was clump up the stairs like this, bang his cudgels. It's in the inn scene, the umpa pa scene. Mm -hmm. Bang his cudgel and then stand there like a rock and sing this awful song. And I said, why don't you start him at the stage door singing it and I'll put a light down on the, on the floor and do a um, linner back effect, which means you throw this shadow right up onto the back wall. Oh, yes. And the back wall was painted as a scene of London um, and put it, put it there and you'll see this great shadow coming like this as he comes up the stairs. And then when he appears, he's actually sung three quarters of the song. And he stands there and you've got this great black shadow, it's very threatening and ominous, and it would work with very simple to do. She said, go and tell Peter. I said, I'm not going to tell Peter. She said, I'm going to tell Peter. And she went down and she said, and he said, stop, 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 stop everything. And we got up, he got up on the stage and he said, I mean, this was a, the measure of the man. He said, Bill's had a great idea and I want him to stage it and fix it. You'll all do exactly as he tells you. And if it works, we'll keep it in the show and I'm quite sure that it will. So we did it and, and it worked and he kept it, the, the entrance in like that. It was much more effective than the one that yes, was before. Yes. But the thing was that um, when uh, Bill Sykes came up onto the stage and stood there, it was already integrated into the scene. Yeah. After the first dress rehearsal, he got up on the stage, called everybody and said, look, after tonight, this show belongs to this man, pointing at me. Oh. And he said, I'm bored with it. I've done it three <laughs> times. He loves it. He said, you can see it all over his face. Every time it starts, his face lights. And it did, because I adore it. I still think it's the best musical ever written. And um, uh, so uh, he said, it doesn't matter what Sir Frank tells you. It doesn't matter what Mr. They're there, I might tell you. It doesn't matter what um, <laughs> uh, Mr. McCallum tells you or their friends when they come around and say, don't use your Cockney accent when you're singing Who will buy it. You do. If anybody says anything for you to do, go and ask him. And if he says it's all right, do it because he'll know whether it's right or it isn't. Good grief. And he's a wonderful wow. fellow. Well, of course, course you thought he's wonderful. We, we, yes, <laughs> indeed. But, but I mean, not many people are that kind of generous. And uh, so it got to the Sunday, it got to the end of the week and we were ready to go. And uh, it, But we had to do the lighting. So uh, Peter Coe said, um, who's going to do the lighting? I said, well, you are. The directors always do the lighting. The people who direct it. He said, I don't bring no one lamp from another. What are you talking about? Um, so we better go speak to Sir Frank. So in we go again, you see, and we say there. And he said the whole thing. And, and um, Sir Frank said, Bill will do it. <laughs> I don't, I never lit a musical. You know, and it's vast, this. It's so big, this show. You know? And so uh, Peter Coe said, well, yes, all right. We will have next Sunday... I said, I'll do it if Mr. Mr. Coe will tell me what he wants in the scenes. And he said, I'll do that. And he said, we'll do it all day Sunday, Sir Frank, which was the stage has got paid a third of a week to do <gasps> that. And Wonderful. Sir Frank gulped and we'll, we'll, we'll all day Sunday, doors locked, just the staff, Bill, myself and my assistant. That was this lovely girl. And um, we'll have um, chicken and champagne lunch sent in. And uh, if we don't get finished by the evening, of course, Mario's will send dinner in as well, won't they? Oops. Well, I, this, Frank Tate's face. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, I'll get killed for this at the end of my career. <laughs> Not at all. He agreed to it all. And we got to, we got to the second dress rehearsal and we used only representative pop, um, props. Mm -hmm. And Johnny Lockwood was playing uh, Fagan and brilliantly, I must say, the lovely Sheila Bradley played Nancy. And... Um, 
Johnny Lockwood had had terrible trouble getting the salary that he wanted out of Sir Frank. Sir Frank had a, a his father used to, he, he had a special pair of trousers, the story goes, I didn't know E.J. Tate, but that uh, when he was interviewing actors, um, they'd ask for money and he'd get up and show that the backside was out of his trousers. Oh. <laughs> and this is the indication of how poor he was, you see. And Johnny had this terrible, because Johnny was a star on the Tivoli and he expected to get more money. And I think he'd asked for something like 400 pounds at the time, and, uh, which was a, a good salary, but uh, they weren't going to give in, you see. And um, he said to do it at one stage to Sir Frank, look, Sir Frank, I'll do it. And Sir Frank said, really? That's great. You know, and he said, I'll do it. If you give me the boys three weeks beforehand, I'll teach them to be real pickpockets and we'll go out and we'll all make money. <laughs> so that was the sort of scene that was between them. <laughs> At the dress rehearsal, second dress rehearsal, we had representative pop props. And when all the, the, um, the boys come into Hell's Kitchen the first time, they, they, they're singing fairly well, but be mm. back soon, I think. And they come in, and the, these great revolve went around like this. And Johnny as Fagan is standing in the fireplace with a fork in his hand like this. And on, because he feeds all these boys a bun. Mm. And he had this great big rattan tray, but we had one piece of bread on it, you see. And they're out the front like this, watching the dress rehearsal. And it got to the number like this, and Johnny looked down like this. And he, he stepped forward, and he said, stop, stop, everybody stop. So nobody knew what was going to happen. They thought there was something wrong in the orchestra. He, saw, he picked up this tray, took the piece of bread, and he says, Sir Frank, you've got five fish and I'll show you a good trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was, it, the whole, it, but it was wonderful. It broke up everybody. And the dress rehearsal, went, that show, when it, when it opened, looked as if it had been running for six months. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, Listen, one, you meet some wonderful people in your life. We're, we're, we're going to have to have a, have a music break here to recover from that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think it's, uh, well, we'll just play it and then we'll tell you about it after. Enya. <laughs> Thank you. 
of and that was the voice of Enya I exquisite voice I dreamt I dwelt in marbled halls now Bill why did you choose that well there's a story attached to that many many years after what we were talking about I Sir Robert Helpman uh, took to directing some opera for the Australian Opera mm -hmm. Company and the f and he always took me to to do his lighting for him yep and we worked together in the ballet, of course, but we'll get round to that at another time. Yep. Um, he, uh, he asked me to go and light Alcina, and I'd never heard of Alcina, and he rang me up and he said, Dear boy, this opera has not been done for 362 years, and when you hear it, you'll know why. <laughs> thought, oh, thrilling, I thought. You know. yes. But it, it, it had been done um, uh, in London mm -hmm. for Joan Sutherland. And... Um, she was going to do it here, but firstly, it was going to be done by Joan Carden. And so I was taken up to Sydney and I, I did that production and it was re revived four times with a different soprano each time. And the third time, Joan Sutherland did it the second time. The third time, it was that beautiful, beautiful lady, Yvonne Kenny. Ah. And I was um, taken by their production director to meet Miss Kenny and she was sitting on a couch facing away from me and uh, I went and, and he tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around. She was breathtakingly beautiful. I don't yeah. know, beautiful, this beautiful auburn hair and lovely cream skin. And, so, and he said to her, Yvonne, this is, uh, the young, this is the gentleman who's going to make you look so beautiful on the stage. And I said, Madam, God has already done the job. Uh, and it, it was, I was so struck by her. Yeah. And she, she was so charming and such a lovely person to work with. And uh, I bought, I have bought every record that she's ever made. Yes. And I heard her singing that song and she sings it exquisitely. And but I heard her this, I played it on the machine one day while I was doing something, I was writing something and went off and, and I had to go and do things out in the kitchen, etc. cetera. And, um, I'm always feeling, <laughs> having to go and do things out in the kitchen. And I turned the radio on. This is only five, five, 10 minutes later. And I heard this lady sing it. I had no idea. What, it stopped me in my tracks. I went and sat down and listened. I thought, yep. It's an equally exquisite voice in a totally different timbre, totally different genre. Everything about it was different, and yet it was it was just as beautiful. It's just 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 yeah. a marvelous, marvelous. Mm. It's a wonderful tune, of course. I didn't know who it was. The ABC didn't back an answer, so <laughs> if I was. Ah, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so you, uh, we, we'll get we'll get back to the Oliver because you you were there with them for then a long time. Well, actually, after its season in Melbourne, um, it uh, it had a break because there was no available venue yeah. in Sydney, and uh, I worked, of course, with the wonderful Betty Pounder, who did all the all the choreography mm -hmm. for it for Peter. And uh, there are many Oliver stories. But uh, after three or four months' break, we then went to Sydney to the Theatre Royal, which was a much better venue for it, and uh, and I was asked to reproduce it. Um, well, mm. you weren't asked in Williamson, you were told. Mm -hmm. And so Betty Pounder and I reproduced it for Sydney, and it had a very, very successful season there, and it's been revived so many times. And the current um, Oliver is, is a wonderful production. Um, it's colourful. It's more of a musical comedy than, than well, shall we say, the, the lightness and comedy of it just uh, takes over rather more than the drama did in the one oh, we right. did. Ours was a musical drama, yeah. you know, and Sheila Bradley was magnificent in it, and so was Johnny Lockwood, and so many others, Bob Hornery. It had wonderful people in it, uh, and it was, once again, a wonderfully happy company, except that in between Saturday and evening shows, I used to have to feed 13 boys. <laughs> <laughs> and at that age, oh, goodness, can they eat? <laughs> yes, oh, gosh, yes, I bet they did. <laughs> 
<laughs> an endless supply of hot pies. Yes, or you or weren't, no, had to be the best of the best. No, it had to be the mm -hmm. best of the best. <laughs> and listen, we've got, uh, now we're running out of time again, so we're going to play a little bit more music by, by somebody of whom we are all, everybody I think, as everybody I know, has a great fondness for B. Arthur. It's a very, very short number. Just listen to this. Can I speak frankly? We'll always be bosom buddies, friends, sisters, and pals. We'll always be bosom buddies. If life should reject you, there's me to protect you. If I say that your tongue is vicious, if I call you uncouth, it's simply that who else but a bosom buddy will sit down and tell you the truth. If I say that your sense of style is as far off as your youth, it's simply that who else but a bosom buddy will sit down and level and give you the devil will sit down and tell you the truth. Jerry Herman. <laughs> wonderful B. Arthur. <laughs> Bosom right. buddies. And I think, Bill, that's a wonderful choice. Well, it has that wonderful sense of theatre bitchery that's so wonderful. Yes. You, know, you get Noel Card on a very elegant level and you get B. Arthur doing it down there and yes. ditch in the dirt. <laughs> it's really great fun. Terrific. Now, we've, we've, we have scraped the surface, but we still have much more to talk about. With, Will you come back again to Golden Days Radio? I'd be delighted. Goody, goody, goody. <laughs> We'll, we'll make an appointment real soon. Right, that's it. <laughs> we'll, we're bosom buddies now. Uh, yep, Did you know that? So, yep. Absolutely. You could actually do that role, you know. You <laughs> get out there and rehearse, woman. Okay. <laughs> this in, in, you're listening to the last an episode of... Go, I've, lost, I've lost the plot. You're listening to Interludes with Chris McKenzie.